winter, the fourth winter in the trenches. The battles of yet another year had passed. Arras, the Nivelle Offensive, Messines, Malmaison, Passchendaele, Cambrai. Hopes of 1917 that had fallen and withered with the autumn leaves. The deadlock of the Western Front remained, but now it was becoming only a facade. Three and a half years of battle had crumbled away the living walls that had once solidly lined the front from Switzerland to the sea. The French army could only replace a third of its monthly losses. Its divisions were skeletons of only 6,000 men. The British army in France in January 1918 was 80,000 men below its strength. In every country, the generals pleaded with the politicians for men, more men and ever more men. Haig confided to his diary, We have plainly told the cabinet in writing that they may lose the war if the armies are not brought up to and kept at strength. In the place of the great armies vanished into gun smoke, there now stood thinned ranks of shaken survivors and recruits raw from the depots. Such was the Western Front of January 1918. In the East, there was no longer a front at all. In September 1917, the final defeats of the Russian army. In October, revolution and a communist government. In December, an armistice and peace talks. Hindenburg wrote, Under our last blows, the Colossus not only trembled, but split asunder and fell. After four titanic campaigns, the Eastern Front was silent. The peasant millions of the Russian army would march no longer as allies of the French and British. From now on, there was only one major front, the West. Russia's fall had transformed the war. Germany's problem of manpower was solved for the time being. Now the Allies, not Germany, were struggling against odds. Hindenburg rejoiced. For the first time in the whole war, the Germans would have the advantage of numbers on one of their fronts. We were now in a position to concentrate an immense force to overwhelm the enemy's lines at some point of the Western Front. Every German instinct was in favor of attack. Ludendorff wrote, The army came victoriously through 1917. But it had become apparent that to hold the Western Front purely by defensive action could no longer be counted on. Against the weight of enemy material, the troops no longer displayed their old stubbornness. They thought with horror of fresh defensive battles and longed for a war of movement. The German soldiers had fought the Russians at Tannenberg and Golitsa Tarnov. The French on the Marne and in Artois and Champagne and at Verdun. They had fought the British on the Somme and at Ypres. They had been skillful in attack and steadfast in defense. But four years of war had crumbled and shaken the German army. It was at last beginning to lose its discipline and its self-confidence. The words, Gott mit uns, God with us, 
were inscribed on the buckle of every German soldier's belt. Did he still believe it? Ludendorff wrote, Loss through desertion was uncommonly high. The number that got into neutral countries, like Holland, ran into tens of thousands, and a far greater number lived happily at home, tacitly tolerated by their fellow citizens and completely unmolested by the authorities. Only a great victory could halt the slow process of disintegration. In Ludendorff's words, in the West, the army pined for the offensive. Week by week, Allied intelligence officers verified the remorseless increase of German divisions in France and Belgium as the crowded trains rolled in from the east. It was estimated that by the spring of 1918, the Germans would be stronger than the French and British by 200,000 men. These were the statistics of catastrophe. In December 1917, the French commander-in-chief, General Pétain, calculated that in 1918, the Allies would face 200 German divisions in the West. Germany will be able to hold her line with 100 divisions. She will thus have another hundred available for a great spring offensive. We are on a tightrope. Only the Americans could fill the colossal gap in Allied ranks opened by Russia's collapse. In December 1917, there was only one American division in the line. It was hoped there would be 18 in seven months' time. Could the British and French, tired, thin on the ground, hold off a desperate German onslaught long enough for the Americans to tip the balance forever against Germany? The Germans too asked this question. Only time, time that none could measure, stood between them and the United States Army. Hindenburg weighed the somber chances. We had a new enemy, economically the most powerful in the world. An enemy possessing everything required for hostile operations, reviving the hopes of all our foes and saving them from collapse while preparing mighty forces. It was the United States of America and her advent was dangerously near. Would she appear in time to snatch the victor's laurels from our brows? That and that only was the decisive question. Time was Germany's enemy. Time was her enemy because of the Americans. Time was her enemy because her allies were on the verge of collapse. Time was her enemy because hunger and blockade and illness were doing their work behind the German armies. The pre-war death rate of German children under 15 doubled. Time was her enemy because German society was beginning to break up. On January the 24th, 1918, 250,000 workers came out on strike in Berlin and other towns. Time hounded her on to a colossal gamble. She must have swift victory or she was finished. She staked every last ounce of her power on a spring offensive in France. Every last ounce, every last hope. Hindenburg wrote, I hope that with our first great victories, the public at home would rise above their sullen brooding, the apparent hopelessness of our struggle, an impossibility of ending the war otherwise than by submission. Ludendorff flung all his restless energy into planning the Kaiserschlacht, the imperial battle that would win the war. The blow would fall on the British, astride the Somme on a front of 40 miles. The German advance would split the British from the French and sweep them into the sea. December, January, February, March, every man, every gun, every lorry, every horse that could be spared flooded into France and Belgium. From generals to privates, the army was trained for breakthrough and pursuit. The objective of the first day must be at least the 